Awesome. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's dive in uh, into week two on our topic of eschatology. And we are looking at tonight specifically Pentecostal eschatology. And so as Pentecostals, uh, what um, uh, distincts, what, what, is, what, what distinguishes us, but also our, our eschatological distinctions for us, for how we approach uh, eschatology and how we approach the study of last things. I want to start, do a little recap. If you weren't here last week, you can go back on YouTube and watch last week's. I would encourage you to, because it sort of uh, lays out a framework for how we're going to approach eschatology. And last week we said this, that eschatology is the story of salvation. That before um, uh, we want to look maybe at cryptic texts or, or things that that have confused people for the last hundred years or so, we want to understand the meta-narrative of Scripture. And the meta-narrative is the overarching theme, the, the biblical world story, if you will, and that is salvation. And how eschatology is directly tied to salvation. We talked about salvation being not just something that happened in the past. We, we refer to salvation as I was saved or um, I got saved, but, but salvation is something that happened in the past. I was saved. It's happening in the present. I, I am saved, but also something that's happening in our future, which is I will be saved. Uh, justification, I was saved. Sanctification, I am saved. Glorification, I will be saved. And we want to, uh, in, 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 the next, in this whole six-week course, we want to be people that move from uh, skepticism to being people of the Spirit. We talked about the second coming of Christ is our blessed hope. It's not our fear. Um, it is our hope, and it is blessed. Um, and we talked about how we are an eschatological people and what that means for us, that we live as people of the Spirit from the end, that we live from the end in what we call the already not yet tension. And so uh, I, I want us to, uh, to start with this, is that Pentecostals, understanding who we are, our Pentecostal identity, is we are people of the Spirit. Now, when I say that, I don't, I don't mean that into saying that People that are not Pentecostal are not people of the Spirit. That's not, that's not what, I'm, what I'm saying. I'm, just, I'm, I'm speaking to how, how we as Pentecostals, how we get our identity as, uh, a, um, as a group of people in our commonality. That we are people of the Spirit. And, and we want the goal, uh, even tonight, when we're talking on Pentecostal eschatology, is to move from skepticism to being people of the Spirit. And uh, because if I'm honest with you, I feel like uh, our eschatology as Pentecostals has been hijacked at times. Um, and one of my fears is that, our, that, that our, our, our eschatological distinctions have become hijacked. And uh, we find in Acts chapter 2 in the book of Acts at large, and we're going to look at this tonight, but that Acts 2 in the book of Acts is the hermeneutical lens that Pentecostals have historically used. And we do not want to lose our Pentecostal distinction even in our eschatology. So I'm a fifth-generation Pentecostal. I've grown up in it. I've drank the Kool-Aid. I was born into it. I, I'm, I am, uh, man, I love, I love Pentecost. I love Pentecostal uh, theology. And one of the things that we hear often uh, in, uh, in the pulpits of Pentecostal tradition is, is the need for emphasis on the, on the baptism of the Spirit, that we don't want to just be Pentecostal in doctrine, but we want to be Pentecostal in experience. And this is a, a large uh, conversation, an ongoing conversation that is happening and has happened for generations. Is we don't want to lose our Pentecostal distinction. And, and 
if I'm being honest with you, I think we have lost our Pentecostal distinction when it comes to our eschatology. We, 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 have, uh, we strive not to lose it in our experience. We strive not to lose it when it comes to speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit. But we need to make sure that we're not losing our eschatological hope um, as well. And the truth is, uh, we may have lost our Pentecostal distinction or eschatology, but, but the truth is this, is that I mean, we want to regain it. We want to recenter ourselves on a Pentecostal eschatology. And I, our hope in this class is to regain a pneumatological centering in eschatology. So let's, uh, we're going to read a lot of scripture tonight. Acts chapter 1, go ahead and turn there. If you have uh, your Bibles, while you're turning there, let's pray. Go to the Lord in prayer and just ask his blessing on this evening. Father, we love you. We thank you for tonight. Thank you for bringing us all here. I thank you, uh, God, that you are uh, challenging us. And Lord, that you are uh, drawing us into a greater love for you. Lord, I pray tonight as we talk about what we're being saved into. And God, uh, as we're talking about the eschaton and talking about the last things, God, that it will move us like what moves us, what we've been saved from. I pray, God, you will stir our hearts and our faith. God, I pray tonight that um, I would do due diligence in my words and my study for what we're about to talk about in Jesus' name. Amen. And we talked about last week, we talked about, um, I would love for us that when we think of the future, when we think of eschatology, that it moves us like when we think about what we got saved from. We say, I man, I've never gotten over getting saved. And when I think of all that God's done in my, and what he saved me from, it brings me to tears. But I want to be able to think about what I'm being saved towards, and that moved me to tears. Of going, man, the, the, the story of salvation and what God's doing is so Moving. Acts chapter 1, we're going to read verse 3 through 11. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, talking about Jesus, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. He talked to them about the kingdom of God. So just put a note next to that. He talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has set the authority has the authority to set those times and dates. And they are not for you to know. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up in a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Now, as Pentecostals, we love Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the other most parts of the earth. But I find it fascinating that the context of that verse is in response to the disciples going, all right, Jesus, so when um, are you going to restore the kingdom?" Like, when are you going to overthrow uh, the Roman Empire? When are you going to reign? And Jesus says, it's not your place or time to know the dates or times of my appearing, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Jesus 
is setting for us a narrative, if you will, of what it, of, of how we are to approach eschatology, of how we are to approach uh, what we think of at the end. And so uh, this is a story of Jesus' ascension, and we live in between Christ's ascension and also his return. Notice the disciples are asking, when will you restore the kingdom? And Jesus' response is simple. Don't worry about the times or dates. Focus on the spirit. Focus on the spirit. So when we're reading Acts 1 and Acts 2, I want you to see that as Pentecostals, we find our identity in these chapters. We find our identity in the book of Acts. And, 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 and where we find our identity in this, it's talking about the eschatology, Jesus coming back. And Jesus says to what? Be people of the Spirit, first and foremost. Focus on the Spirit. As Pentecostals, we find our identity in the Pentecostal narrative. And like Jesus told the disciples before his ascension, don't worry about the signs. Focus on the Spirit. May we recognize that the Spirit is eschatological proof of Christ's second Rather than restoring the kingdom before his ascension, Jesus promised that the spirit would be poured out and the kingdom would be present by the spirit of God. This is the already not yet tension. And we're going to see in Acts chapter 2, we're going to continue to read. We're going to see that as the Spirit is poured out, that the Spirit is proof that Jesus will return. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, we're going to bounce around in this chapter to give us a good overview of the whole chapter. Um, But for the sake of time, we're not going to read the entire chapter. On the day of Pentecost, all of the believers were meeting together In one place, suddenly there is a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now jump down to verse 14. And and, and, and this, the, the people are now entering into the streets and and the Jews are going, oh, these people are drunk. You know, these people are, uh, you know, it, it, they're, they're, they're drunk. What, they don't even know what's going on. And Peter steps up, verse 14, Peter stepped forward with, 11, with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These men are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is too early for that. Maybe they thought it was five o'clock somewhere. I don't know. It's a joke. (laughs) A little dad. It's a song. It's too early for that. Not that you should be doing that, even if it's later. (laughs) Verse 16, no. Notice this. No. What you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Verse 25. King David said this about him. I see the Lord is always with me. Talking about Jesus. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts with praises. My body rests in hope. 
Notice this, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You've shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself for he died and was buried and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's descendants would sit on his throne. Verse 31, David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father has, as he has promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out among us. Just as you see and hear today, he's saying Jesus is already reigning at the right hand of the Father. But now we're living in the not yet. And Peter does something fascinating. As Pentecostals, we continue to do. Peter understands that the Spirit is eschatological proof that we are in the last days. He says, hey, the Spirit's being poured out. These people are not drunk. In fact, it is a fulfillment of what Joel said that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit. The last days were inaugurated when the spirit was poured out. So from the day of Pentecost to now, we have been living in the last days. We talked last week about the inaugurated eschatology, which is uh, the long phrase for already, not yet. That the spirit being poured out inaugurated the kingdom of God's reign here on earth. And the already, not yet tension that God is reigning, but yet not yet physically reigning on the earth. And Peter also says this outpouring of the spirit... It's proof that the Messiah's resurrection means our resurrection in the future. In fact, what he does is he ties it back to David. He said, David spoke about this. David understood that God would not leave his soul in the grave to rot. And he's correlating, Peter's correlating that scripture to Jesus' resurrection as our hope that we will be future resurrected, that David will be resurrected from the dead like you and I will. But how's he doing this? How's he making this connection? He's making the connection that it is because the spirit is being poured out that the resurrection of the dead will happen. How is it, how can this be? Because the same spirit that lived in Christ now lives in us. Romans 8, 11 says, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Now, we're going to read this in just a moment. The next, we, we love that. Oh, I, the spirit lives in me. But contextually, Romans 8 is about eschatology, the resurrection of the dead. And the point of the Spirit of God living in us, yes, is to sanctify us. Yes, is is to uh, guide us. Yes, is to comfort us. Yes, is to give us gifts. Yes, is to give us bare fruit. But may we not neglect the Spirit inside of us, living in us, is proof of what is to come. It goes on to say, and just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. That the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the eschatological spirit of Christ is now the eschatological proof of our future resurrection. 
Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, Peter centers the early church in the eschatological conversation on the Spirit. It's Pentecostals. We must center ourselves in the eschatological conversation once again on the Spirit. Daniel Iskrig said this, without Pentecost, the event, without Pentecost, there is no reminder of his future, of Christ's future appearing or assurance of future resurrection. That the Spirit is assurance that we will one day be resurrected like Christ is resurrected. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I'm reiterating this in numerous ways because it's, it, the, the Spirit is proof of future resurrection. That's what Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 1 shows us, that, that, that when they say, well, when's the kingdom going to happen? Jesus says, just focus on the Spirit. Don't worry about the dates. Don't worry about the times. Focus on the Spirit because the Spirit is our sign that Jesus will return. As people of the Spirit, the Spirit is our eschatological sign. If you look at early Pentecostal history, our Pentecostal distinction has always been the Spirit. We're going to talk about what this means for us tonight, but I want us to uh, as we are continuing the conversation on eschatology, to recenter ourselves on the Spirit. I want to look at um, two attention, if you will. We're going to call size and signs. Size and signs. Size eschatology and signs eschatology. Now, we are talking in the context of our Pentecostal distinction. And size eschatology, I, 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 would, I would say, was an early Pentecostal distinction. That this is uh, how uh, Pentecostals understood uh, themselves in, uh, in the eschatological conversation. In size eschatology, what it does was it, it focused on the Spirit's sighing or groaning for redemption within the believer as the primary sign of the nearness of, the, of Christ's coming. The size of the Spirit, the groanings. We're going to read Romans chapter 8 in just a moment where it uses this language for the Spirit sighing and groaning. In size eschatology, specifically as we're, as we're looking at the early 1900s in Pentecostalism, um, size eschatology focuses on what God is doing in the altars of the church as proof that he is going to return, looking at, at what God is doing in the altars rather than what is happening in the newspaper to show us Christ's soon return. As people of the Spirit, we get our cues from the Spirit and not from the news. Amen? We get our, our cues from, from, from the Holy Spirit and not from CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are sort of the big three, so I just named them. And so uh, the size eschatology is uh, pneumatically expressed. So when I say pneumatically, that means spirit. Pneumatology is the theology of the spirit. And so it's expressed... Through the Spirit. Size eschatology. Uh, uh, Daniel Iskrig, I'm going I'm to take these three points from him. Uh, he says that it's pneumatically expressed in three ways. Images. Hopeful. 
and active. Images meaning, uh, some of the, the phrasing that we will even use tonight is this idea of the latter rain. The latter rain of the Spirit. And I don't want to jump too ahead because I'll, I'll explain it a little bit uh, in the future. But in Palestine and in Israel, uh, th- they, would, they would have what was called the former rain and the latter rain. And uh, Pentecostals, and not just Pentecostals, but in Scripture, they would pick up on this, this imagery of the former rain and the latter rain. And now uh, they, would, they would say that the, the day of Pentecost was the former rain. And now the outpouring that started at Azusa, the outpouring that's happening in our midst, that's happening in our altars now, is the latter rain that is speaking of uh, the coming of Christ. Because in the last days, God is pouring out his spirit. It's pneumatically expressed being hope-filled, hopeful. It's pneumatically expressed by being active, meaning that we are people that live from the end. We talked about this last week where God is reconciling all things to himself. What does it mean for us to live from that place? What does it mean for us to live as people that are reconciling to others, reconciling to God, reconciling with ourselves, and reconciling with the earth? That that, that it requires something of us today. The the, the focus of size eschatology, typically, I'm going to make a broad uh, statement here. There are nuances to this, but uh, typically the focus is on the resurrection and on the reign of God. The sighs were spiritual manifestations of the Spirit that were showing the nearness of Christ's coming. That when people were getting baptized in the Holy Spirit and miracles happen and there's this outbreaking of the Spirit in our midst, it shows the nearness of Christ's coming. As Pentecostals, this is how we've always thought. This is how we've connected ourselves as Pentecostals into Scripture because this is what Peter in Acts chapter 2 does. This outpouring that you see shows that we are in the last days. And so as uh, people of the Spirit, we are focused on the Spirit's act, the Spirit's activity. Then we have uh, signs eschatology. Signs eschatology, um, just for the sake, I, I'm going to read it here, but signs eschatology is an empirical approach animated by a cultural hermeneutic by which events in the local newspaper were correlated with biblical prophecy in order to determine the nearness of Christ's coming. In essence, the focus is on what is happening in the newspapers to to distinguish if Christ is coming because this world event is happening. Christ is coming because this is happening. And and, and the, the, the tension to is to move away from this towards this and, and when we do that, what happens is we lose our Pentecostal distinction and we move towards uh, signs becoming the way that we interpret Christ's second coming. And then what we said, we don't want to be Pentecostal and only doctrine, but we also need Pentecostal in practice. That becomes a reality because we've shifted from uh, Pentecostal distinction. Um, this um, signs eschatology, uh, whereas this is new, pneumatically expressed, we're going to say that this is typically dispensationally expressed. Whereas size eschatology is moved through images of what the Spirit is doing, Dispens- uh, signs eschatology is moved by events that are happening. Listen, you don't have to uh, be around 
Pentecost for, for long, or not just that, but American evangelicalism specifically to know um, uh, Mussolini was the Antichrist, Hitler was the Antichrist, uh, you know, whatever president gets elected that you don't like is the Antichrist. You know what I mean? Like, like it, it's moved through events that are happening. And Mussolini was a terrible guy and definitely had the spirit of Antichrist. Same thing with, with Hitler. But they are dead in the ground somewhere. It didn't happen. They, that was not it. Um, signs eschatology is more pessimistic instead of being hopeful. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. And listen, it is tough <laughs> to not look at the world and go, God just burn us all up. But we can't forget Colossians that God is reconciling all things. The future in which we're being saved too. Signs eschatology, whereas this is active, we need to do something today. We need to send missionaries. We need to build orphanages. We need to help the poor. We need to be active. Signs eschatology uh, tends to be escapist. We just got to get out of here. Cannot wait till the rapture happens and we can get out of here. The focus on signs eschatology, whereas size eschatology is on the resurrection, the reign of God, the focus typically on signs eschatology is on heaven uh, and the rapture where it comes to escaping uh, the world and less on the resurrection of the dead. I'm making some generalities here, but those are where the tendencies happen. The challenge for us then is to be people of the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, and looking to the altars as proof of Christ's soon return rather than the newspapers. Because for us Pentecostals, the altar is an eschatological What happens in our services is not just something that, that gives us goosebumps and we go home. It is an eschatological act. Well, what do you mean it's an eschatological act? Because the altar is where we are sanctified by the Spirit into the image of Christ. As Pentecostals, we come out of Wesleyanism. And our concept of baptism in the Holy Spirit is not new to us as Pentecostals. In fact, John Wesley and the Wesleyans use the exact terminology of baptism in the Holy Spirit before we ever even thought of using that uh, terminology. And, and uh, the idea of baptism in the Holy Spirit, they equated it to entire sanctification, which is where you would tarry and where the Spirit would come on you and transform you in the love of Christ to fully be able to love like Christ loves. And for us, the altar is where we experience the already sanctifying work as we await the not yet sanctifying work. That for us as Pentecostals, the altars are a part of everything we do. It is a distinguishing mark. Now, let's talk uh, maybe through some on specifically a Pentecostal eschatology. You hanging out with me? Let me grab a 
grab some tea. D.H. McDowell. You may not know who he is. He was an early Assemblies of God pastor. And in 1925, he wrote in the Pentecostal Evangel, he said this. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a feature of a program. It is the program. The preaching of regeneration, the restoration of man back to God, the outpouring and the baptism of the Holy Spirit upon believers, the working of signs and wonders and miracles in the earth are features of this program leading up to its grand and glorious fulfillment. The second coming is the program. Daniel Iskrig remarks that early Pentecostals and Assemblies of God specifically believed the Holy Spirit was being poured out because it was the last days. This allowed the early adherents to emphasize the centrality of the Holy Spirit as the primary sign in their narrative of the unfolding of the future. What the Spirit was doing in the altars of the local assembly was proof that these were the last days. See, a Pentecostal eschatology is centered on the Spirit. I'm going to say this until we are blue <laughs> in the face. It's Jesus' response to the disciples to send the Spirit when they asked about days and times is still his response today. Focus and center on the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, we're going to read some verses here. 16 through 25, and I'm going to give us from this text uh, what the Spirit is proof of, what the Spirit is eschatological proof of. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 through 25. For God's Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. When it's talking about the glory that is going to be revealed later, it is not talking about the triumph over the present circumstance. It is talking about the eschaton to come. It's talking about the world that is yet to come. This is an eschatological passage. Verse 19, for all creation is, eagerly, is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope. The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, as a, future, as a foretaste of future glory. There you go, the Spirit is being eschatological proof of what is to come, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children. Notice this, including the new bodies he has promised us. If you were had any suspicions that this wasn't about the future glory, the future uh, second coming of Christ when we will get uh, new, new bodies. Verse 24, we were given this hope when we were saved. 
If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something, we don't yet have it. Don't yet have what? Our full salvation. We must wait patiently and confidently. See, sometimes, and, and we talked in our, our last class about how do we read and interpret the Bible, it's important to, to read things in their context because it's easy to pull things out. I mean, we are heirs with God, and we can think of the, yes, there is, there is the already reality of being heirs with Christ, but there is the not yet reality, the future glory that is ahead that we need to make sure we're not losing sight of. The tendency, the tendency is uh, when we move in the tension between signs and size eschatology, the more we move to signs eschatology, it all comes, becomes about us and what's happening in our world. And we move away from the reality that like, hey, this is way bigger than us. This is way bigger than our own comfort, way bigger than our own suffering, way bigger than what's happening, that there is a bigger picture that is happening. I don't know about you, I actually find comfort in that. Of going, man, I don't have to worry. Like the world, it really isn't all about me. I just, I can actually enjoy life. I don't have to worry about all of this stuff. <laughs> so let's look at four things. I mean, these are going to be four uh, essential things to a Pentecostal eschatology. The Spirit is eschatological proof of sonship. I don't know, and maybe you can help me with this. I was trying to think, what is like a uh, like a, a a gender neutral term for sonship, son, daughtership, like son and daughtership. I don't know, uh, childrenship. I don't. I was trying to think of that. I was like, is there something I could use for the ladies uh, than just sonship that 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 help? You know, would help. Uh, yeah, just just help. Um, so if you can think of something, you guys gotta get some kids that are <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> personship. You know, then we're getting into like, I don't want to get like, you know, sonship. Because we are sons and daughters of God, we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. The spirit is proof. Romans 8 verse 16 says, the spirit joins our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. The spirit is proof that we are heirs with Christ Jesus to what? The kingdom of God. But we are already heirs, but we are not yet heirs. That we are not yet reigning over the earth with Christ. The already is that we are brought into sonship. The not yet is that we will one day rule and reign with him on earth. The Spirit is proof of sonship, but the Spirit is also proof of eminence, if I can spell it. Maybe you even put the last days. Some refer to this as the this is that hermeneutic, where Peter goes, this of what you're seeing is that, that this is what's happening, this that's happening is that. Peter looked at the spirit being poured out in Acts chapter 2 as the eschatological sign that the end had begun, and that the imminence of Christ's return was upon them and is upon us. It is important to note here, maybe it will help you, Imminent does not mean immediate. Sometimes we want, to th we, we want to get this confused. Imminence can mean immediate. But clearly, his imminence 
in the first century was, did not mean immediate. Acts chapter 2, verse 16, Peter says, No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. I want to read Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. Instead of just reading what he's quoting, it says, Then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. The spirit is proof we are in the last days. The spirit is proof of the imminence of Christ's return. In early Pentecostals, they would identify the work of the spirit with the imagery of the former and the latter reigns in Israel. With the idea of two reigning seasons in Palestine, the former and the latter reign, Pentecostals are able to identify the day of Pentecost as the former reign and the contemporary Pentecostal movement as the latter reign recipient of the biblical promises. Uh, a lot of the early imagery that the Pentecostal movement would use and even continues to use today is that we are standing in the latter rain, the latter rain outpouring of the spirit. We cry out for the latter rain spirit of God to be poured out. Perhaps you've heard it said like this, that we are in the last of the last days. That would be referring to that we are standing in the latter rain. So uh, the spirit is eschatological proof of sonship, is eschatological proof of imminence, and eschatological proof of future resurrection. Romans 8, 23, 25 and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We groan with the Spirit for what is to come. And the Spirit is proof of personal and corporate resurrection to come. There's going to be a personal resurrection. And there's also... In that resurrection, the corporate resurrect, the personal is that we will be resurrected to our new bodies. When we say new, we talked about this last week, that we don't mean it in the sense that it's going to be overly different, but that God's going to do a new work with our bodies. That Jesus was still recognizable. He bore the scars of his crucifixion so it wasn't a different body it was a new body I just hope I, I get some hair <laughs> but then again you may not be able to recognize me that's just a scar that I've got to live with for eternity I'll take it up with the big man so this is the personal resurrection it is our blessed hope then there's the corporate resurrection, which is, it's not just going to happen to one of us. It's going to happen to all of us. And when's it going to happen? At the return of Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read a long passage here. Verses 13 through chapter 5, verse 11. Because, like we discussed in reading and interpreting the Bible, the last course, the letters weren't written with verses. They weren't written in chapters. They were written as one whole thing to be read in one whole sitting. And oftentimes what happens is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 are treated as two different events. When you're going to see here, contextually, it's speaking about the same thing. Verse 13, and now, dear brothers and sisters, 
We want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Boom, that's the context. They want to know, hey, uh, we thought Jesus was coming back, and he didn't, and we knew when Jesus came back that like we were going to be transformed and get new bodies, but what about these people that have already died? Like, are they just like out of this? And so Paul's writing to address this. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet him in the, to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Now, concerning how and when all of this will happen, this is a new chapter, chapter 5. Dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you. Notice that. We don't really need to write to you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. So that is what he's saying. Don't, you ain't got to worry about it. For you know quite well, verse 3, when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly and pregnant uh, women's labor pains begin. There will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters. You won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. It is important to understand here that he's saying, hey, like we don't have, you, you know it's going to happen anytime, any moment. Then he says, when people are saying everything's peaceful, there'll be no escape, he's going to come unexpectedly. It's easy for us to look at this as a sign of going, okay, we need to look when things aren't peaceful. And then that's when it's going to happen. That's literally what he's writing to say, don't do. And he almost doesn't even include it. He just says, I don't have to tell you. I'm going I'm to continue on um, and tell you. You're not dark in these things. Uh, in, uh, verse 4, dear brothers and sisters, you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us. So that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you're already doing. We see that the spirit is the eschatological seal of resurrection. The spirit is our eschatological seal of future resurrection because the same spirit that resurrected Christ is in us. So then when we die, we do not have to worry about what is on the other side because the same spirit that is in us was in Jesus and like Jesus died. Just died. We too will die. But as Jesus was resurrected, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus will resurrect us. And it's important also in uh, Pentecostal uh, eschatology for us to understand that um, we uh, firmly uh, believe that it is going to be a literal return, a uh, literal resurrection and a literal renewal of the earth.
It's going to be a grand event. First Thessalonians chapter 4 is this like, it, it seems magnificent. It's going to be literal. It's not going to be spiritual. It hasn't already spiritually happened. It is yet to come. The kingdom of God has always been of concern to the people of God and wondering when this kingdom will be established. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. All right, Jesus, tell us, when are, when are you going to establish your kingdom? He says, don't worry about dates or times but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Spirit is eschatological proof that the kingdom of God is, all, is inaugurated in our midst. It is already, but not yet. The church now lives under the dominion of the kingdom of heaven in anticipation of the second advent for the full consummation of the kingdom on the earth. I want us to see that Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 show us that the church was never meant to do eschatology without the Spirit. Eschatology was never meant to be all about the signs and not about the size. I mean, Jesus is pretty clear in Acts 1. I'll give you just an, an example. The book of Revelation begins, and the book of Revelation is often uh, is like, okay, this, this is going to tell us what's going to happen. Um, I would encourage you to go in and, and, and listen to week eight on reading and interpreting the Bible on how we approach Revelation. Like all scripture, it cannot mean something for us that did not mean something for them. It does not negate that it also does not uh, have real meaning to us because it had to have meaning for them either. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, John the Revelator writes and says, I, it was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Suddenly, and he's taken into this vision. So it begins with the Spirit. And then Revelation 22, the last chapter, verse 17 says, the spirit and the bride say come. Talking about the Lord's coming. Let anyone who hears this say come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. I really believe this, that when the spirit moves in the altars of our churches, this, the church echoes the Spirit's call for the Lord to come. Say Maranatha. We had a powerful service today at the 10 o'clock. Powerful service. And it's when those moments happen that the church echoes the Spirit's call for the Lord to come quickly. The Spirit is the one in the church, stirring us towards the blessed hope that lies before us. Often we don't realize that's what the Spirit is doing because we don't realize the magnitude of the work of the Spirit. Modern evangelicalism has equated the work of the Spirit into a, a small corner uh, box where uh, the Spirit is just helping guide us. And yes, the Spirit guides us and teaches us, but it sanctifies us and the Spirit is with us and the Spirit is giving gifts and bearing fruit, but the Spirit is a foretaste of future glory. The Spirit will resurrect us like the Spirit resurrected Christ. The Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Spirit is not something for us to just write off. But I want us to see the church was never meant to do eschatology without the Spirit because it is the Spirit and the bride that say, come. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Um, if you are interested, uh, a couple... Uh, 
book recommendations that I would give you if, you're, if you want to kind of dive into um, some of the topic that we did last week and also this week, but we don't have time to like fully uh, dive a little deeper into those topics. Two books. Um, there's a book called Surprised by Hope by N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright. He goes by Tom Wright as well. Um, N.T. Wright is a leading New Testament scholar, uh, theologian in the world. He comes from uh, the Anglican tradition, and he has a book called Surprised by Hope that is about the resurrection and about uh, eschatology. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, Another book is called Imagining the Future, and if you're interested specifically um, about Pentecostal eschatology, but even more specifically, the history of Assemblies of God eschatology, pick up Daniel Iskrig's book, Imagining the Future. Um, and it goes well in depth. It breaks down uh, the four major periods of the Assemblies of God movement and how uh, the eschatological conversation shifted and moved in the tension between size and signs. Because we've always been people that move. Um, and he has some some great insights that I think uh, would be helpful. It's re- that that book is a little harder to read. It's a little scholarly. He's a historian, and so um, it's a lot of information. Um, so I would really recommend those two books. Cool. All right. Uh, any questions? We always do Q and A. And so if I haven't muddied it, yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, I believe. So the early church, <clears throat> Acts chapter 2 said, uh, Peter goes, hey, this is what happened in Joel chapter 2. And as Pentecostals, we go, hey, this is what happened in Acts chapter 2. You see how, how that works? We are... We are uh, trying to read scripture um, uh, like uh, the early church did. Sometimes we fail. A lot of times we get it right <laughs> with all things. And grace, the Lord has grace. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to know if there was going to be a mm-hmm. time that the Antichrist yeah. It's great. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the question is, is um, the tension, right, between size and signs? Um, and the tension of are we supposed to be in the middle? Are we supposed to be more on one side or the other side? I would submit that our Pentecostal distinction is size eschatology. If you look at the, the history of the Assemblies of God specifically, Um, uh, we have a strong history of taking our eyes off of what is happening in the altars, off of what's happening in the spirit, off of those things, and looking towards this to give us clarity, if you will, for what's happening. None of us don't, none of us don't like to know what's happening. We want to feel like you know, it's easy to go, it, yeah, it's not easy, but it, it's, it's maybe comforting to go, well, that thing is the mark of the beast, so I'm not going to take it. Or that person's antichrist, so I'm not going to agree with them. Or uh, I, in, in, 19, in 1920, there was an article in the Pentecostal Evangel that said uh, when workers' unions were rising up and uh, that said workers' unions were, uh, were, was the mark of the beast. And if you join a union, you are taking the mark. Well, clearly, <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> so 
we want to move away from skepticism to being people of the Spirit. So I'm submitting that we need to move away from this towards this. You go, well, then what does it mean when this happens in the world and this happens in the world? I think it means a lot of times that our world is sinful and that humanity is broken. And we need to be reminded of the meta narrative of scripture of that's their salvation to come and that Jesus will rule and reign with righteousness and justice and every evil doer will get what they deserve even if the Hitlers and the Mussolinis reign now, they will not reign in the future. If you want to read the book of Revelation powerfully, you will see that when it's talking uh, um, about Babylon, you, you, there's so much. I mean, uh, the book of Revelation is written to a persecuted church that is facing these events and persecution. And, and, and the whole book is about this. Hey, every, it looks like the beast. It looks like uh, is, 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 is more powerful. But, but God is way more powerful. And when he returns, he's going to set all things right. So though you may die now, you have a hope of future resurrection. You're going to suffer for a little while now. And that little while might be 40, 50 years. But you're going to reign for eternity. I don't even remember the question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Instead of making me pessimistic, it actually makes me feel better and say, Mr. Says I've been here and I, I, yeah. care, I care about people. Right. I don't want anybody yeah. behind, you know, so it's like so I, I think, spirit, yeah. You know, well what we need to be doing as Christians. Yeah. So the things with the signs, signs are very subjective. Well, nineteen forty eight when Yeah. Yeah. The original language after all those years, but that was talked about in the Bible. So I don't know. I all signs yeah. aren't, aren't subjective. Um, it, it, I, the the book imagining the future would be great um, because it, it walks through even that time period of like so. In uh, the Pentecostal movement, when that happened specifically, there was a strong shift away from this to this of going, okay, now, like, this is it. Like, they're going, they're, the, the sacrifices will continue. Well, they're going to rebuild on the temple. They're going to, um, this is going to happen. Um, I, I, think, I think it's important for us to understand, um, I, let, me, let me put it like this when we get into trying to interpret everything through signs, we become a lot like the first century Jews that missed Jesus's first coming. And they missed his first coming because they said, well, it, it can't, has to happen like this. So like, well, in Israel, and, and there are, so yes, so there, 1948, many would say yes, that that is a sign that that has, that has to happen before Christ can come back. That's only one, there, are, there is a large portion that would also say, like, that doesn't have to happen. And that national Israel would, would is not the same as ethnic Israel. So I, I, I think um, that there is... Um, uh, I, I do think it can be problematic when we start equating the, the current nation of Israel as the Davidic Israel. Um, I, I, think, I think that there can be some problems that occur there more um, broadly theologically when it comes to how do you get saved. Salvation comes only through Jesus, right? Like, well, no, and so I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to give perspective. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, and and so with um, with um, yeah, I, I I I lost I lost track of what I was saying, but um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Mm hmm.
I would say, yes, sir. That's what I would say. Yeah, I would say um, that throughout our history as Pentecostals, we have uh, hitched our wagon, if you will. Um, so in uh, early Pentecostalism, we were outsiders. Uh, we were weirdos and still are. Um, we, but we longed to fit into, we, we came from, a uh, majority of early Pentecostals were very poor. Well, as time progressed, uh, we began to move up the economic stature, and um, we understood that our eschatology is very similar to like f- fundamentalist eschatology and dispensational eschatology, and uh, because they both lean on the imminence of the return of Christ. Uh, dispensational eschatology stems from the idea, though, that uh, it's, it divides up into seven dispensations and that the work of the Spirit is not in this dispensation. It, it comes from a cessationist um, background, which is anti-Pentecostal. But we, uh, throughout our history, adopted... Um, ways of looking at the world in this tension between signs and size. Um, And we hitched our wagon, in essence, (laughs) to fit in and kind of be going, hey, we're just like you. Like, hey, actually, we have our beliefs are really like, are kind of similar to yours. Um, Really shifted in in, uh, around the 1940, 1950 period, when we were admitted into the NAE, which is the National American Evangelicals, or not NEA, National Evangelicals of America, the NEA. And then about a decade later, where our superintendent of the Assemblies of God was elected as the, um, uh, uh, the president or the something of that organization. And so with that, there are uh, maybe doctrinal ties, uh, or be- not to say doctrinal, belief ties, on non-essentials, because all of this is a non-essential. In times is non-essential. I, I love the joke where it's like pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, as long as I make the trip. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't, it doesn't um, it, it's all going to work out. And the point is to see that the Holy Spirit is proof to you, is assurance to you that it is going to work out. The Holy Spirit is assurance in your life that there's a resurrection coming, that if you die, it's not the end. The Spirit is the hermeneutic that Jesus told the disciples to use and is the hermeneutic the early church used to understand that they were in, that the end of the age had started and they were in the last days. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. We really like to make sense. Especially for analytical people, I, I'm I, I'm more analytic. It takes it's take it takes a lot for me to to command that like this is this is this is the spirit enough? Um, we like to make sense of where we're at in the world, where we're at in history. Uh, but there's coming a day when Jesus is going to return and. That's what history is headed towards. That is the, we talked last week, the telos, the telos. That is, that is, that is the end. Um, and it's not an end of annihilation. It's an end to which that is actually birthing something new. And that's, that's the beautiful part. Amen. All right, so... Um, this week, I, like last week, I said, hey, we were going to do, um, this week we're going to talk about different views as far as um, 
charts and stuff like that and when's things gonna happen and how are things gonna happen. Um, but I wanted, I, I moved this, we're supposed to be week three into week two because I want us to understand how as early Pentecostals, uh, how, how did they believe, but also what informs our Pentecostal eschatology and how we, um, uh, how we are to be faithful as we talk through the others. So next week, my goal is to present um, uh, the four main views. I'm going to do each of them justice. I'm going to try to do each of them justice. I don't adhere to all four of them because I'm not, it, that wouldn't, that's not how it works. But it's important for us to understand that, um, one, these are non-essentials to the Christian faith. Um, because Jesus is, everybody agrees that Jesus is coming back. Everybody's trying to figure out the dates and the time and how that's going to happen. Um, but I, I believe scripture is faithful in showing us a working framework for um, a, a timeline, if you will, of maybe what the future looks like. But we, I want to walk away of going, man, uh, we want to understand where other people are coming from and going, oh, maybe I'm, Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Um, because I don't want to miss the second coming like those that missed the first coming because it didn't happen how I said it had to happen. And that is, um, uh, you know, Jesus can't be the Messiah because this, this, this. And, and we would say, well, no, he fulfilled all of the scriptures. Clearly the Jews didn't <laughs> believe that he did. Um, and, and, and so we want to be we want to be faithful uh, to Scripture and not imposing our own um, these 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 four main viewpoints onto what Scripture is trying to say to us. So um, distinctions for us: His return is imminent. Um, and we should be ready. We should be alert in the Spirit and the Bride. We say, come, Lord, come quickly. Amen? Awesome. Let's pray. Father, we love you. I thank you uh, for tonight. I thank you for every person here. I thank you, God, that we're growing and we're learning. God, I pray that uh, we'll come next week and, uh, Lord, we'll continue just to expand our knowledge on, on this, this conversation. Pray you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, and one week I'm really looking forward to is we're going to look at Judaic eschatology, like week four, week five, and look at what uh, the 